Hello and welcome to ClapperCast. I'm your host as always, Carson Tamar, and today I'm joined by Mr. Editor-in-Chief Jack Luke Sharp, the good old Nick Grasso, and Hilary White to discuss I Saw the TV Glow. Yes, finally we are covering this film. I was looking at 2024, and I thought there was no way we could have ClapperCast, you know, take place across 2024 and not cover this film. Such a unique and very raw, vulnerable project, one that has touched multiple people on this podcast very, very personally. And today, I think we have a very personal conversation that reflects the power and uniqueness of this film. Yes, we get into why we love the film, the pros and the cons of it, but we also share the personal power it gave us, and I think it creates a really beautiful little episode for you to enjoy. Just a warning, though, that in, you know, know a typical fashion right when we get a big episode and it's really personal and it's going really good all hell breaks loose as far as trying to record it the call kept dropping so just know if there's some inconsistencies here um, with audio quality i think the video might go out towards the end a little bit um, or if there's any weird cuts or things that sound awkward no we did our best so with that let's get right into our review of i saw the tv glow I know this might sound crazy. I don't want to alarm you. Do you remember a TV show we used to watch together? It was called... The Big of Eight? Yeah. Do you watch? Okay, and I think it's only fitting we start with a guy today who saw this film, I don't think at its premiere, I think I got yelled at before because I said that, but near its premiere like the same festival i think oh no not wait was the sundance i don't know you saw it hella early that's the point nick you saw this film very early at a festival you were the first one to kind of warn us all about what was coming and i mean that in a very good way take it away with your opening thoughts on i saw the tv glow um i saw the tv glow was one of my most anticipated films of the year because I really much loved we're all going to the world's fair by jane schoenbrun it was one of those movies that you know, you just watch it and you think, wow, this was really good. And then after two weeks, you're still thinking about it. And after two months, you're still thinking about it. And it just like stays with you. That's always a sign of a great film. And so I was excited for whatever they were going to do next. And the next movie was, I saw the TV glow. And so I was premiering at Berlinale. I was also going to Berlinale to participate. Sadly, the premiere was at the exact same time that they were doing the Golden Bear Lifetime Achievement to Martin Scorsese. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> You know what? Um, I'll go with Marty for this one. But I managed to watch the film at another screening, which turned out to be the last screening that the director attended to do a little Q&A at the end, which was a very pleasant surprise. And so I watched this in a packed cinema with a lot of people not knowing what we were about to watch. Um, And to say that this film floored me would be an understatement. To say that this film changed me would be an understatement of sorts. Um, I found this film to be absolutely terrifying in the outlook of what it means to be untrue to yourself, constantly hiding who you truly are and running away from it. Um, The moments where you see Owen so close to grasping what he wants, what he wants, what he truly is and what he wants to be, and then choosing to run away hit very, very close to me in ways I was not anticipating, um, to the point that I had a panic attack (laughs) towards the end of the movie, which sounds terrifying. It kind of was, but it felt like a waking up call of sorts. Um, And so even after the screening, after, after watching the movie, I was still kind of like recovering. And it felt weird because, in a way, I kind of wish... I'm glad there were other people around, but I kind of wish there was no one else around to fully express my emotions because to be surrounded by people were just kind of like, ah, ah, okay. Ah, that's the ending. Ah, (laughs) kind of like going like that. Ah, I guess it's none. You know, and just leaving um, was very odd while I was going through my own inner uh, turmoil in that moment. Um, But yeah, Jane Schoenbrunn was amazing during the Q&A. And then they stood around after the screening to just like talk to people and talk to fans. And I managed to talk to them after the screening. And it was very personal. It was very nice, very heartwarming. Um, 
And I loved the movie so much that I watched it another time at the festival. And then once it came out on VOD, I watched it once again. I've already seen this movie three times. I want to watch it once more if I can soon enough. Um, because it just touches on so many things that I am passionate about on a deep, just human level, but also in terms of craft. Looks amazing. Sounds beautiful. It's very moody. It's very atmospheric. There's a lot that's just left either to like small touches in the dialogue or small little details in the set design. There's very little exposition or, you know, like trite dialogues as you see in so many other movies. Many have called this Lynchian. Uh, I don't fully agree, but there are definitely elements of Twin Peaks The Return, especially with the use of music throughout. The soundtrack here is impeccable, whether it's the Alex G original score or the actual original songs that are played throughout the film, um, to the point that the claw machine segment that kind of like cuts the film in two, um, it's one of my favorite sequences in any film this year, maybe my favorite sequence. It gives me chills every time. So just in terms of general impressions, um, I love this film. My favorite of the year, um, an instant favorite of all time, which is something I say very rarely nowadays, you know, for something to just like instantly become a favorite. Um, and I'm excited to know what all of you think about this film. I can go next quickly because I'm just going to pretty much echo everything you said. I mean, we've talked about this during our rapid review segments on this podcast, so it shouldn't be anything new. Um, I loved We're All Going to the World's Fair. I remember I saw that at the Sundance premiere and everyone else was like, oh, that isn't really that good. Two stars. And I was like, this is actually really like lovely. And then as that's a film, as you mentioned, you stick with it more. And especially because at the time I had no context um, for the filmmaker or anything about that. So I'm just experiencing this lore. And then you learn more and more about the filmmaker and their personal journey throughout production of the film and it becomes this very rich piece of identity um, and trying to find identity and trying to find belonging and it's a really great film I rewatched it this week and again it was just like blown away this film or this filmmaker as you mentioned is just someone who every single one of their films just gives me a genuine panic attack so like love that good on them because it's that in the best of ways um, I saw the TV glows you hyped up and I was like okay, I really liked Rogue One the World's Fair, but now like I have this big expectation because Nick loved it. And sometimes Nick and I love you so much, and I've said this to you before, you will love a film <laughs> and then I will watch it and I will go, I'm not really seeing the vision on this one. So I was just, I was nervous, but I was like, I'm just going to go in and full blown blew me away. Love this film. Um, obviously there is a certain level of this entire podcast, right? And everyone here, I think I feel comfortable saying um, there's a certain level of this film that we cannot necessarily relate to or engage on. I want to be very explicit with that conversation. Um, but what is here, I think, is also, though, incredibly rich um, and vital for everyone to see. And you can relate it to pretty much anything in your life. Um, this is a massive wake up call that there is still time. There still is hope. And it's incredibly haunting, but it's also a very reassuring film I found um, that plays around with narrative form, emotional form, um, filmmaking, like the visual form of filmmaking very very interestingly um in a way that like I, we kind of mentioned it before um we started recording but we talked about seeing this in an empty theater and i saw this for the first time in an empty theater thank you my local film community for never going to films because i can just experience each one in a private screening um and it's like genuinely just like was one of the most shocking viewing experiences of my life um having this just assault you with all these wild pieces of lore and you're putting it all together and then it becomes so raw and so personal so quickly um i think what this filmmaker is doing is unlike anyone else out there and i appreciate that we have distributors who are actually distributing these films and putting them on this wider field um where people are seeing this this is accessible this is available to be seen um, I think that is beautiful, but just, I mean, quick thoughts, and I know it's kind of rambling, um, very haunting film, very well put together, very emotional, really wonderful performances throughout, amazing use of music, of color, um, meaningful uses of color. Um, I really love this film. It is absolutely one of my favorite films of the year. If it wasn't for Challengers, if it wasn't for Luca, this would be my favorite film of the year. Um, but it certainly is one that, like, immediately hit me in a very deep way that I can't say 99% of cinema, especially new releases, um, hits me. So I really appreciated that. I can go next. Um, I, I'm sort of going to be the outlier here. Um, I watched this an hour ago. We were just talking off air about, about like 
I feel like generally shell shocked to talk about this. So partly my, I I probably won't be so analytical with this because my reading of it's very, still very very fresh. I need this to settle, which is, again is probably an uh, is is an issue that um of mine. Not, um, unfortunately, not not for this podcast, which is which I'll I'll take on board. Um, I I know very little about this filmmaker. I know that the the film beforehand, um, the predecessor. Uh, that was at fan- is it Fantasia Cast? I think someone covered it for Clapper, and I remember it being, uh, or it was at least it was on a film festival circuit we did, and there was comments about it then about, about like, oh, this is going to be, uh, like very much marmite. People are going to love this and people are going to hate it. Reading about this filmmaker, just try and catch up on, on the thesis and the abstract and stuff. Obviously, worked with the Safety Brothers uh, as a production assistant, um, very much as a film producer as well, um. The, the the very much being a, a part of the the system behind it, um, and then has found a calling, a coming out, finding um, an open and honest an honestness with themselves, um, and then has and has sort of quite bravely uh, decided to pick that in the uh, in the modern mainstream uh, cinematic market. So it, it it's it's probably one of the very few because we were just talking about this off air. So apologies if anyone's going to bring this up, but very few active trans filmmaker it's not just about a film about a trans allegory but but a trans filmmaker bar maybe lana wachowski in a mainstream um corporate setting that, that, that has touched a considerable amount of um of, of, of screen especially with cinematically in the theater and then on demand i know i knew very little about this very very little bar carson had watched it i think a few weeks ago on your rapid reviews and nick as mentioned it multiple times, so I was, I was wanting to go watch this purely to, to uh, see a filmmaker blossom because usually I find these filmmakers two or three years down the line, and I I really want to to be in the midst of someone like finding self growth and finding a cinematic form that evolves. It's very rare to find that. I I I don't think this exists without Lynch, specifically with the Return, the Twin Peaks sequel series. I don't. I know that a lot of people have seen that as somewhat of a negative, like as, as seeing it through a prism. I don't really see it that way. I think it's actually quite an enlightening aspect of we're watching a very fresh, very unique uh, filmmaker uh, boldly and bravely projecting essentially their story, but 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 probably a, a tale about trans allegorical um, narrative. And I think looking at Lynch, I think it probably could only be put in one way where it feels to be that idea. Of, look, this is very difficult for me to talk about because I'm 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 a, I'm a white um, man who is not queer. Um, I'm a straight male, so it's very difficult for me to sort of try and discuss a filmmaker's uh, try to articulate a filmmaker's viewpoint and 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 not to sound like I'm a gaslighting b condescending or, or or see trying to project an ideal that's not um the form that being said if anyone you know it just it, please go with me because i do i do want to be part of the conversation so to bring the pitchforks down slightly um i think it, it, it's a very <laughs> sort of trying um trying not to like follow my own and she was well this is gonna be this is very very rare for me to like uh, not just go on and on so anyone out there just this is one of a very very few um this is a very bold type of feature it's very new it's very fresh it's about a filmmaker who is doing equally as as promising returns it's very esoteric and it's very visceral and it can only really work in that identity of like the idea of body dysmorphia which granted someone who has body dysmorphia and then someone who has the the uh, trans idea idea of body dysmorphia uh, the two vast differences although i suppose the the disorder is, is is presumably the same about looking in the mirror and not seeing a representation of who you are um and i think the idea of going through that that again that medium that prism of a lynchian um aesthetic works really wonders here it's an interesting film to get get through because it, it it's an it's an hour of one film and forty minutes of the other. 
And ironically enough, both of them survive with each other and both of them can't survive without the, without the other. The problem with that is that you watch the first hour and you need the first hour. But to me, it's probably a tad too long in the first hour and that we're sort of meandering and it sort of needs that because it needs to have the identity of being we're lost and we need to find ourselves lost because that's ultimately the feeling that these characters have got from the beginning. So very much... Um, contextual very much very much conscious uh, from the reviews i've read there's a people have an issue with that split i really like the second half more than the first presumably because the first half of that story is something that is very different to sort of my life therefore there'll be some subconscious distance between that and, and me so as an audience member that being said the latter half of watching your life in the midst of not taking risks or essentially what you don't think at the time are the correct decisions and, and second guessing it is like a very difficult thing for me to sort of look at because I also find that to be a tremendous amount of, of, of weight on, on my own shoulders. So there's a lot here that makes the, the, the experience very difficult to watch. It's a very tough um, experience to watch regardless if you see the trans allegory or not. And it's interesting, Cass, I know you probably get back into this later, so apologies we talk about how conscious this is. It's hard on reflection not to see of how definitive that allegory is. That being said, I do think this works tremendously in the aspect of just being isolated, about being a different um, ethnicity, a different race, uh, essentially the same thing, but a different sexuality, a different gender, and just a different type of personality. Um, I think it's really interesting how the idea of getting lost into the idea of nostalgia the idea of, of media changing. There's a lot here to actually discuss. It's not. I, I think the trans allegory is here in tremendous spades, but there's a there's a there's a true depth here about growing up and seeing a lot of it change and you being alone and you not making those jumps because you like the safety net. Very difficult to watch. An hour and forty minutes. Probably you it probably be toned down slightly to about from ten ten minutes or so for me personally just to just to get us more so into the point, but it, this is a very brutal type of film, a very, very difficult watch. So I'll move, I'll, I'll, I'll very thankfully move this on to Hillary, but um, I'm very much interested in sort of this educational standpoint here as well about how, how other people are sort of responding to this because it definitely feels like you're going to this alone and you, you, you it's very difficult, very difficult questions with equally as difficult answers. I'm glad that Nick, you went because I read your you have quite a passionate review, which is sort of like genuinely sort of almost choked up reading. People are going to go into this and find an outcome that's going to be quite hopeful. So I'm I really I'm really glad it exists, um, and it is a fucking difficult watch. Um, that being said, I'll have to throw this here because I'm sort of waffling, but it'd be interesting to to hear your opinions about all this because for me it, it, it's generally it actually haunts me watching this film well um i'll t i'll take the reins and uh um the way i found out about this film i think i was vaguely aware of it because of what nico spoke about before which was the previous film we're all going to the world's fair i'm not sure if that's the exact title but i at least the gist am i right guys okay yes i'm getting a thumbs that's the up. right one <laughs> And it's like, it's like, well, yeah, we want to get the title right. And I don't have it in front of me, but uh, watching this a second time um, and, you know, writing down what I thought was important to talk about was um, things that create um, a lot of headway or like um, a ripple of reactions through the queer communities that, or just mainly queer people that I know, um, things that make them react or they end up, you know, sharing with you or ends up on social media where it's like, I can't stop crying. This actually really touched me. And with, I saw the TV glow. I think that's the second time that's happened to me. The first time it did, um, I shut down a lot of my social media accounts, not because of toxicity or problems with people or anything. I just wanted less screen time, but, um, way back when on some of them, I just started seeing the word Nanette over and over again, over and over and over. And people just being very emotional about it. Um, and it turned out to be the Hannah Gatsby special. And with I Saw the TV Glow, I noticed the same thing, people having this visceral um, experience with the film. So I thought, even though 
I don't consider myself a queer person. I don't consider myself trans in any way. But when I hear about things like that, I really very much want to be in that space. And I want to understand how those things touch people who are, have a completely different life or um, body experience than I do. So I went and like Carson, I ended up going into the movie theater and being completely alone, which in a way it did make sense. It was a weekday and it was a matinee. So it was really early. So not exactly when a movie theater is hopping and full of people. And that's exactly the way that I would hope everybody would be able to see it because it's such a lonely, isolated experience. The characters, it seems like the characters are only talking to you and it adds to the whole surrealism part of the film. And, uh, I'd say that my reaction in some ways, it runs parallel to the one that Jack is having right now. He used the term shell shocked and I I had something similar and my, my rating did start lower. I think I gave it three and a half stars because I thought my experience of this is definitely a five. I am feeling a lot of things. I feel destroyed. Um, I don't understand what this means. And I, um, the movie theater that I went to was kind of like off of a freeway and I ended up just kind of walking around the various businesses there and just trying to process what I had seen. Um, since then I it's gone up to like a four and then like a four and a half as far as the experience, because it was so unique to me and watching it again for this podcast, I was a lot more careful and really paying attention to what this serves as far as like an allegory or a metaphor for the trans experience. That was very important to me to really, really get it this time. But I found out from the film that there were things for me as a cis person as well that I still identify with and deeply, deeply care about. And I think I'll probably save some things for my final thoughts on this film because while I was watching this, I thought, oh my God, this actually did happen. Things in this film did happen to me in a very strange way. And it was very, very touching to realize that, but my story is completely different. So I think mainly what resonated for me the most was the relationship people have with media, um, isolation and, you know, loss and, you know, um, the media you consume being a very, very important part of your life, especially, you know, the more the generations go on. Uh, and I think the timeline as well, it does start in the nineties and I've had conversations with my nieces, they're 14 and there is kind of this I don't know how to put it. There is a nostalgia for the 90s that's kind of surfacing in our culture right now. And when I do talk to them, I said, I wish that you've been able to come of age then because there was just a lot. It was a little bit better in some ways to come of age during that time um, than it is now. And I feel like in some ways they have been robbed of some things, you know, just, you know, basic privacy and all of that. But uh Overall, like I think right now the film start is at four and a half for me. Um, it's a phenomenal film. I have to echo what everyone has said, you know, whether it's positive or negative, it's a very powerful film. And um, I have absolutely no regrets. And I think like Niccolo, I probably will watch it a third time, um, own a copy, um, and of course recommend it to people who I think, very specific people. Like if you're having a nervous breakdown or mental health issues, I did think about that. I think it was in the first review I wrote, like if you're having issues, like it's maybe not the right time to see it for you. It's for a very specific audience. I, it's one of those films that's interesting, right? When I saw it, I immediately was like, oh, I have three friends who like, I desperately feel like I need to show this to because I feel like it can change slash I and just with a filmmaker in general even if their previous works I feel like this is a filmmaker that will like genuinely save lives um with the work they are creating and it's hard to talk about this film we're all kind of like <laughs> I noticed like um paddling maybe against the current a bit because it's a very complex film right like number one 
very personal to the filmmaker. Number two, very personal to, I assume each of us, we all have like a different relationship with this film. Uh, Mix that with queerness, mix that with a very personal relationship everyone has with the film. There's also just so much happening within this movie. There's a relationship to media, um, just in general, flat out. What is your relationship with media? Um, Specifically, this came out at a time that I was like losing my mind writing an article about the power of gay pornography because I was pissed at queer representation in media um, because bad films made me really mad. Um, So like that's just immediately like on the thing. There's a whole conversation here about just feeling like you're suffocating and dying because you've accepted yourself in whatever situation. This is not to be queerness, but in any situation where you're not doing your like living your authentic self or doing what you know you want or need to be doing. Um, And I think that's a very big conversation you can put that absolutely on queerness on transness i think you can put that to pretty much any person out there has something where like is this life the one you want to be living to your full potential and there's still time Mm -hmm. to make this life whatever you want it to be right um and it's super like complex emotions because you watch this narrative of owen obviously and it is like this haunting especially at the end just like depressing like gut punch of seeing this person go through it and continuously push it down and this character even at the end never has like um that breakthrough moment where like everything is just like on the right path they continue to suffocate themselves and it's haunting but still the film is very explicit there is time and even at no matter what age no matter what situation no matter what your circumstance is there is a way to break free of that um, there's also just the very complex like lore. What is the actual like narrative story on a very basic level of what is happening in the film? And that is very difficult to understand and explain. Um, there is the whole like queerness element of like repressing yourself and then putting it like um, in, in the context of this film, it's like on a TV show where like, you repress your emotions and you put them in a very specific outlet. There's just so much here, right, to get into. And every single one of those conversations carry a tremendous amount of weight um, and complexity. And I think that is one thing about this film is it's not a reflection of like, I've lived through this experience, let me reflect on it in a way and get out the bingo cards, everyone, like Call Me By Your Name, for example, is where that is touching on a very <laughs> complex thought of queerness, but it's coming from a place of, ref- of reflection. This is not a story. This is not a journey that you end, that you just get away from. This is it. This is in the past. And maybe it will, right? Maybe, I, again, I can only speak to my life experience, but this is coming even from a filmmaker who's very much so, I think, in a journey, on a journey that is never really ending. So that also narratively puts it weirdly um to where like we're constantly i think fighting to live the lives that we want so just like there's so much here that is so raw and so vulnerable um and to see a film like this that i think takes all those themes and handles it perfectly and puts it in this big package like it is confusing it's a lot that i this is my third viewing um i watched it once alone then i took my friends to it um and we got high during it i will say not recommended <laughs> um no do <laughs> that not was do an adventure <laughs> <laughs> that was an adventure. Don't recommend. Um, and then I watched it this time at home. And each time it just kind of hits me like this really weird, like, well, not weird. Like I've never had a film that I watch and every time hits me in a very personal, deep, like soul shattering way, but in like a completely different sense as it feels like it's like breaking down your defenses in a way. And each time, yeah. no matter where you're at in your life, you're going to get something different from it. Um I don't, and Nick, it's interesting to hear your reaction to your audience members who just kind of watched it and left it and were like, oh, that's kind of shitty. And like, there are people who are like that. A lot of people love this film. I'm not trying to like um, say, like, oh my God, everyone hates it and discredit humanity. But like, Mm -hmm. there are some people who just like watch this and don't get anything from it. And I'm not really sure how that is the case because I feel like, and not to echo our (laughs) Napoleon review last week, (laughs) this is a very like incredibly personal shocking feature that I think touches on the human condition not to also use buzzwords that other people use this week um, in a way that like I don't know how you don't watch this and just get blown away from it and feel incredibly like um, shell shocked as you mentioned Jack like I it just there's so much here but I feel like it's also just like I will acknowledge a very hard film to talk about which makes doing a podcast on it very fun <laughs> and very weird mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah it's I envy anyone who can watch this movie and not be affected by it in any way because it means they've lived such a beautiful life you know just just like without feeling disadjusted without feeling like feeling like you belong somewhere 
Um, that's something I've never really felt for multiple reasons. Uh, I've lived in eight cities when I was growing up before settling in one. Um, kept moving around and stuff. Never really had friends. Never really belonged properly anywhere. And so to see so much of myself in Owen was so impactful. And then to have like people <laughs> just like leave the screening and be like, ah, it was all right. Um, it also speaks to just the nature of the ending. And also just like you were saying, Hillary, as well, like our relationship to media as a whole, mm-hmm. because people love finality. People love meaning. People love closure. And when someone purposely denies that, I think is incredibly powerful and bold and something that I respect. Um, are, can we talk spoilers or is that for later? Oh, episode? this is fully, I think it's spoiler territory. Full like spoilers. spoilers. Okay. <laughs> yes. So the first time I watched the movie... I mean, destroyed me and everything. Yeah, yeah. But it just felt. I told this to to the director. I told them it feels almost like a cautionary tale of like, don't be like Owen in a way, not condemning him as a character, but just like, it's never too late. But try not for it to not be too late itself. You know, to change and to embrace who you are. And they told me that actually, like the way that I saw it was a very pessimistic ending. But they helped me see the final moments as more hopeful than I originally imagined. And they actually originally wanted to show Owen kind of like starting or actually going through the ritual that Maddie talks about, you know, uh, when she's doing, when she, they, I'm, I'm so confused, like which pronouns for the character itself, which for the actress, but they say she for Maddie. Um, when she comes back and she's talking about all of the uh, ritual of, you know, uh, going, to, 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 um, covering myself in dirt and being buried alive and then being reborn. It was originally supposed to end like that, but then it was like, you know what? That's a bit too obvious. It's a bit too nice and neat and tidy. So just, you know, let's remove that. It leaves some ambiguity, but also I think it makes people want to talk about the film more, which I absolutely love. And indeed, rewatching the film, and even on my first viewing, there's so many little bits of dialogue early on that come back towards the final moments of the film that I think are so just... Mm. Like, I love a good screenplay. <laughs> I love a good screenplay and clear direction. It's just so nice to see on screen. Um, and it is indeed far more hopeful than I was expecting. But also, I totally understand why this is not um, necessarily a film for a mainstream, wider audience than we think. Also, because this is, I don't really see this as a horror film in the stereotypical sense, mm-hmm. even though that's how it's kind of sold. There's no jump scares. There's barely any violence. But to me, this was definitely one of the scariest films I've ever watched. Um, it was the push that I needed to kind of like um, embrace myself more going forward. And and I've seen this with other people, with other movies. It's so weird to experience it from other people first. I had a friend who um, completely changed their life after watching The Lighthouse. The Lighthouse gave them a full-blown like anxiety attack in the screening, which was very <laughs> frightening. Um, and then... Yeah, just to experience it myself in a weird way. It was very surreal, very unexpected. But yeah, bless people um, who watch this film and don't feel anything. You know? Yeah, the, it, to be quite blunt here, this is a feature that takes absolutely no prisoners. And I think when you watch it, I get granted it's slightly ironic because I've only seen it once. But I think from, from the idea of the projection of the thesis is that the whole point is to do so. It is it, not interested in to sort of walk you hand in hand. This has to be as brutal as it is in order to for for the the actual context of it consciously to be as compelling. But I also think that subconscious, like you said, Nick, about like walking away from this. If you don't walk away, from, and that, that not to get like some like stereotypical father here, like to to embed like the you know you need to do this and do that. If you walk away from this and you don't feel an an, an, an iota of um, personalization of this work, you haven't engaged with the medium. You have not engaged with the media. So uh, people going into this, and uh, to, to, to speak very bluntly about it, if you go to watch this and you walk away and this doesn't hit you, you have not engaged. You're just not interested to do so. That's your prerogative, but there's no problem with that. But this feature takes absolutely no prisoners. And looking at it... Uh, um, from again as a conscious level and a subconscious level i'm actually quite glad it doesn't because 
this this goes embedded into the idea of what you said about it being a horror. And I think people say, because I've also done this and I've like the last 10 minutes working through this, my brain just listening. It's very much going to be like a therapeutic uh, <laughs> episode for me this week. Um, I also think that's actually a positive that people project this as a horror because to to have made these decisions as Owen's character and for an audience to project their own insecurities and see that as such as it being a horrifying thing that it's working, then the then the the ideal that it projects that it's not working on a subconscious level, it's consciously affording the fact of you know. Owen is a shade of who you could be. He's probably he could could be a mirror of who you are. He could be you. And I think that the idea that the audience see that representation and use the use a genre as horror to project their own securities, I think probably elevates this material. At least gives it um gives it the identity of how good it is. The one thing I wanted to talk very very, very bluntly about, and again to echo Carson about the bingo card, I just want to talk about Lana Wachowski for a second here because. Uh, it's interesting. I've done. I've done um, a P. I've done an MA. I've done a thesis on the Wachowskis twice. I must have done thirty thousand words uh, on on an academic level. And at the time, if anyone was alive, uh, that Hillary said about the nineties is that that's a time where I think for a lot of trans representation is very much a thing about uh, Paris is burning. It's an offshoot of society that is, is often represented represented in minority and then demonized as sadistic or sexual in nature and seen as like escaping um mainstream uh, and then throughout the 90s and this is just from my perspective so it'd be very interesting to hear hillary's and uh, and as for that uh, us two being the, the the elders in the room i don't I hope you don't mind my mistake i don't mind i don't mind whatsoever i'm very comfortable um, with that it's okay yeah um, yeah I think it's interesting how that perception has changed. When The Matrix came out, I don't think people, obviously, consciously, whether filmmakers or not, it wasn't seen as a trans allegorical tale. How that's grown and evolved with Lana Wachowski's journey and then Lily Wachowski's journey and seeing that then the representation of culture has opened up and society has opened that up as a normal act of people having issues with their own gender, having dysmorphia, and now able to make the, make that change and feel comfortable. I think that that's probably a representation of the positive positivity in society. Granted, that's not to suggest that there are slight issues surrounding that of how society and culture at whole is, is has those moral debates, which is, is just is just accessible to begin with. If, if having have someone having to go through that and having to like ask the state, but that's that's another conversation entirely. But my point is, is that. The, those type of materials are not consciously stated as such. They're always subconscious. And I remember reading about Lana Wachowski for the research, and um, she was interviewed um, by another trans artist who did a book about the Wachowskis, which I think is contemporary director's exceptional book, goes all the way throughout the filmography from Bound um, all the way to, at the time, probably would have been Sense 8. Um, and I think it didn't. it was too early for Resurrections. But the point of the matter is, she talks about in that book about, um, and this, uh, I, just be very wary here about trigger warnings like that. I don't, I don't want to overstep the, the mark here, but she's talked about being on the, um, um, the on the the sh- Chicago. Um, there's a certain on the loop in Chicago about wanting to throw herself off, and about because she was uncomfortable who she was, and I think, yeah. Then you watch the Matrix and you see essentially. Thomas Anderson Neo reject that that dead name and then d- destroy the antagonism of of whatever Agent Smith is the opposing force at that at, at, in the loop, which is ironically I think is the brown line as well. There's a there's a, an interesting parallel that's grown there through the subconscious. This film isn't doing that. This film isn't a um, let's talk about it ten years after the fact as I've I've grown and evolved. This is a consciously made film at the time of someone's trans growth. It's only a few years ago. So it's very rare for us as an audience to actually witness that at the time when it's actually being conceived and progressed in a natural state as, as the filmmaker is growing into it. So it's actually quite an honour to watch this in a certain way. To see how, and again, that's why I go back to it being quite brave and a bold piece of media. Uh, media because that growth of trying to find out you know, this and stuff like that and putting that story on it's also not only a narrative that the audience is engaging with, like growing and, 
and seeing the allegor- allegory, but, but essentially being told these narratives. It's also for the filmmaker. So it's very, very brave. There's a brutality to this. Um, and I think from, from a, a filmmaker who um, has, has probably been f- found representation to be quite difficult and the idea, I, I think that's an interesting one with how it propositions its characters, its thesis, specifically its abstract in the fact of how it presents itself in its form, aesthetic, um, and how it gets there with a mainstream audience. Because at the same time, it's not mainstream in the fact that you can just get this and lift with it and and evolve with it at the same time. You have to actually work with it. So it's interesting how it's got to a point of feeling it both worlds. It's independent. It's it's very boisterous. but It's also mainstream and people are able to find this as an identity. Um, that the, the only thing that comes from it, it and, and this is like a bold statement I do feel like it's the eraser head of its time in the sense that I think a lot of people are going to gravitate towards this like they did the Matrix and be wowed in the idea of have you seen this it's fucking what it's weird it's very strange and go on a visual sense it will all be st- simu- stimulation and then it will slowly grow in the subconscious through an audience and people will probably work a lot more with those those that allegory, but the interesting aspect of it is is that it's so on the not on the nose, but it's so much more precise and conscious. It will be interesting to see how a larger audience, um, or at least in the next five or six years, present uh, will ultimately grow with this because it's not a feature that, granted, it has nuance and it, and, it, and it's very very subconscious in in all of its attributes. But the, it's, it'd be interesting how people will see this and either straightforward, reject it or not. Now, there's a conversation about that, but the, the, where I'm just getting to my point here is that the, 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 the good aspect of this is that because it presents itself as such is that you can either accept it as a trans allegory or watch it as a, as a threat. I think it's actually really beneficial for the experience because it's there and it will always be there but you can also watch it like this. And I think all the great type of features that wrestle with those themes um, are, are very interesting to get into the human psyche because, and this is where it becomes slightly dangerous, but you can present this on AMC or Shudder or Netflix or Amazon Prime and a 45-year-old man who doesn't particularly agree or vote on these aspects may perhaps watch this as watching it for Halloween or something like that and subconscious, this film will grow in a sense of, oh, like ugh, I can't get this out of my mind. I can't get this out of my mind. And all great films have seeds, and, it, and it, if this this is going to have a, such an interesting lifespan, um, especially what the filmmaker does next. But I think this is a really good start point of setting the seed. If you want to, if it's, it's so obvious, it's so over, it's covert. But if you're not, if you just want to see it as a horror film, it's still there in the background and it works wonders. Sorry, Hillary, go on. I know I went on a bit there, but... Oh, yes. Um, well, the first thing I want to say is that I, I, I agree with you. I didn't make the connection, but there is something very unique about this film. There's nothing like it that I think does put it parallel to Eraserhead because there's no film that's like that either. And it has a very specific um, uncomfortable feeling like this one. But uh, what I was going to say is that I did write down a note the second time I watched it where I thought this definitely has connections to The Matrix as a trans allegory. But of course, when that came out, it wasn't viewed that way at the time. Uh, This, I think, is more... I saw the TV glow. I want to call it existential horror because it can work on people in different ways. It could be about age. It could be about gender dysphoria. It could be about a lot of things. And um, with the Wachowskis, I've tr- I'm not a comedian in any way, but I'm like, there's got to be like a great joke in there because I've explained it to people who understand me very well. I'm like, I love the arc of their career because they got in there and they made all these movies. And then eventually down the line, they're like, we were women the whole time because there's no way that they would have been able to get as far as they were. And I just find that personally very amusing where it's just like... Um, being not only being true to themselves, but it totally makes you look at their films in a different way. But I want to turn this back to Niccolo and Carson, because both of you are openly queer. The thing that's 
interesting about this film in particular, because I did, I did a tiny bit of reading. I can't say that I've um, listened to a lot of interviews with, with Jane or um, looked into the production or the behind the scenes um, workings of this film. But at one point they did point out that there was, it was this uh, term egg crack an egg crack moment where you start realizing what your identity is and that the first step is coming out to yourself. I think for some people, they always know, but I think particularly with Owen as an avatar, he has to come out to himself first. And that's part of the existential horror of the film. So I wondered how Carson and Nicola, how you guys felt about that. Is that relevant or not or whatever? (laughs) I, I I can take this if you want, Carson. <laughs> um, th- it, that was definitely the part that I connected with the most is how many times Owen has the possibility of actually going on what would normally be, you know, like your typical fantasy Matrix, whatever, like uh, Alice, Alice in Wonderland movie where... You know, you have the white rabbit, he's like, follow the trail, and, you know, you start going down, and, oh, you find yourself, and you grow, and everything. And every time that moment comes, Owen runs away. Um, I think especially one the moment where I knew the movie was hitting in ways I was not expecting was when uh, Maddie tells him, like, I'm done, like, I want to leave town, do you want to come with me, like, we're gonna leave tomorrow because fuck this place, Um and he just runs away to the mother that he's been pretending he's been going to for like two years at this point for, for like sleepovers mm. and stuff, and just like cries at her and just like call my dad, tell him I, I've I'm not been to, I'm I've been lying the whole time, just kind of like putting himself in the worst possible position to avoid actually following himself. Um, in some ways, not not to this extreme, of course, but in some ways, I've definitely sabotaged myself over the years um, from pursuing some some experiences and some some relationships and some things that probably would have helped me far more back then to just accept myself in some way. Um, and so to see that reflected on the screen was incredibly frustrating in a very personal sense of just like, what a fucking idiot. It's like, and that's me <laughs> like 10 years ago, you know, it's like Jesus Christ. Um, and, and yeah, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse until it culminates to all these moments. And, and yeah, like it felt like the right moment to just fully embrace this. So it was something I wanted to do for a long time of kind of like not not just not coming out to myself in a way, because that's something I realized like back in like 2019, late 2019, um, but just kind of like in a way where there was no shame around it, where it was normal, where it, where it could be just something I am and I do and then just go on with my life. Um, and I think the moment, yeah, when... Owens is screaming, I'm dying. Yes. Like that yes. specific moment. I, I, all I could hear was just like my heartbeat in my ears. It was like, kind of like, like, like mm. a machine gun. I was like, Jesus Christ. It's like, how, like, and, and that's when I, and yeah, like we use it, the word many other times. And, but like you said, Carson, I genuinely believe this can save lives. I genuinely believe it can put people, it can show people just how bad things can get. And also remind them that it's not too late. Um, and definitely like feeling that moment, like the reminder that hope and salvation was always there for him in a way, mm-hmm. which can be, you know, yeah, it can be the trans reading or like a more general queer reading. But I think even just in general, just I think the power of this movie is that it's so specific. And I think that's true of like all the best movies, to be honest. It's such a specific story about such specific little details that it ends up connecting on a deeper human level. And I think it's almost impossible not to relate with it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I I think it's incredibly powerful in that sense. And yeah, frustrating. <laughs> I, 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 also, I also really like the fact they don't villainize Owen. Because I think yeah. it's, 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 it's quite a poignant tale of regret, like you said about sort of like not necessarily self-sabotage, but it doesn't villainize it in the fact that when you read the material or even just read the read the film itself, is that we all make we all fuck up, we all make drastic decisions because we're not ready to make that jump. If that's through identity or if that's through commitment, regardless, there's very difficult um, aspects in life that are very much not black and white. Very much like the conversation it's putting forward now about sexuality and gender, it's mm-hmm. not very straightforward for a considerable amount of people on this earth now. 
Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's all there's there's a fluidity to it where there's no sort of necessarily right or wrong answer. Um, and it, and the fact that it shows Owen's tail, um, it, it doesn't villainize him. I actually find that really quite welcoming because you can watch this and you can essentially watch the film villainize this character. But but also there's there's also like uh, ripples of like autism in here. There's also ripples of of um, feeling uh, without without direction, without the family members there. With the the fact of be becoming lost in your own in your own world, there's a lot of richness here. But the point I'm trying to make is that you could easily villainize Owen and be like, "He's a fuck up. Don't do the same things he does." You know, and I also like you said about your reading about. It, there's a bit of hopefulness here for a lot of people. It's interesting at the same time. Will Ferrell's um, partner, um, comedic partner, who wrote for SNL, has come out as a as a trans woman, and they're doing a documentary about it. And it's interesting that the first comment will be there is like, when did you know? When did you know? Well, she might not have known until fucking two weeks ago. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a progressive nature, I, I imagine, just feeling like welcome to, you know, finally come out. Like no one can, no one can, unfortunately, it can be taken away from you to, to find that moment. Mm-hmm. But I also think that, you know, that's there's no, there's no fucking time bomb on it, I'm sure. <laughs> there's no time bomb. It's not like, I feel hungry now, I'm going to go eat. It's nothing like that. And I, I, I do, I, I do, I don't, I don't mean any disrespect for speaking for on behalf of you two about the Queen or something like that, but I just think it's an interesting one about like Owen, um, Owen's character found out twenty years after. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, but he just found out twenty years after, and that that openness of him apologizing, the realization of like, God, like I can, I can, for all these years I can be free. I don't think we should look at it as a regretful nature as well. I think it is quite. Um, Hopeful, like you said, Nick. In a way, it's probably the one thing where I'm like, "Oh, thank God that saved it for me." Because I didn't, I don't, I don't want to watch this character, and I feel like we've watched this a lot with with um, uh, lesbian dramas recently. Like it, they're all period pieces. Everyone's fucking miserable because they can't <laughs> be with the one they love, and I, I actually think that representation reinforces an ideology that's very not healthy, very not healthy. That was then. Let's be. Let, let we have such a progressive time now. When we shouldn't dishonor. Um, the the issues that came beforehand, and we should not not de- acknowledge them, but we, we should talk about how progressive things are. Granted, without not also acknowledging the the issues that we have in modern day times, but it's also really nice to see that it's not a bad thing that he found out twenty years. He still found out where where he wants to be. He still found out like I I don't want to do this anymore. I, I want to. Be. There's a really sort of fucking lovely eye opening aspect to that. It's a one saving grace where I felt like they, they could damn him to oblivion. I don't want to watch another queer film or another feature that that touches on these subjects for a mass audience to like damn someone because they weren't open about themselves. Like we shouldn't. I don't. I, again, I'm, I might be preaching to the fucking choir here, and I'm like, mm, everyone knows this, but I do think it's important to acknowledge. It's like let's just not fucking damn people because they might find out a decision about themselves. Five or six years growth is a thing. You know, there's things we would have done ten years ago we wouldn't have done now. People vote for different people. There is a there's a, a really great growth. And I think the things that happened in Owen's life here are really, really similar to representation of other people's life. You know, that where yes, mistakes are made, but we are not defined by them, we're defined by the present. We can still make choices for the future. So it's it's a very slim, bitter note, so not to bring the mood down or anything. But I don't want to sit here and listen to Nick bastardize, bastardize himself for not doing things that he maybe should have done or been open to himself. You know, life isn't as linear as linear as people say it is. Representation of fluidity. You should be. I want. I don't want anyone else to say that. I think it's fucking heartbreaking to listen to. Um, but yeah. I'll move on now because I'm getting a bit upset by it. But, I'll, uh, but Carson, you take over. You fucking rescue. Well, but I, I just, I just yes. think it's very nice to see it's not bastardized. Well, I just want to keep on that because I think one thing that I really appreciate, and I think it speaks to the film and the screenplay and the voice behind it, is that so many non queer, straight cis people are coming away with that same take and same understanding of Owen. Because, like, I think it's really hard, even if you conceptually understand, but like, if you don't have that coming out process, the weight of that and it's an ongoing 
thing every single day. Um, the m- film that plays in my mind, and this, and I don't think anyone would predict this is something that I think about quite often, is the scene in the first Spider Verse where he says it's a leap of faith. And like, I feel like in life, just in general, but especially with queerness, every single day, truly, like you just have to have a leap of faith because it doesn't end, right? Your leap of faith versus the egg crack moment coming out to yourself, coming out to friends, coming out to family, maybe after that, depending on your circumstance, obviously. But every single day, you have to be so aware and like not to like over dramatize it, but you have to be so aware of your queerness and your identity when you're in an Uber and the Uber driver asks you, Oh, do you have a girlfriend? You immediately are put in that place where you have to have genuinely every single day a coming out process of like, where do you then sit there with that? Do you come out? Do you correct them? Do you not? Um, I imagine, especially if you're a trans individual with pronouns and with identity, that only, you know, gets bigger and bigger. And then you have to think about in every single circumstance like that, the consequences of it. I am very conscious as a queer person sitting on this podcast and thinking about putting this out to the internet because there is toxic, evil, awful people out there who will search for things like this. You know what I mean? Like, I am putting myself in a place of vulnerability. We all are talking about queerness on this open platform. Obviously, I think we all stand by that perfectly fine. I like, uh, obviously, I don't want to over dramatize it, but it's something that's very conscious. Having the rainbow flag in my Twitter bio is a conscious decision. And it's one that people have attacked, right? I have been very much so on the receiving end of a lot of Jesus hate, shout out, um, whatever film it was. Um, queerness, it's not just you come out and it's done. You accept your understanding of identity. And the coming out process, just coming out to yourself is like this wild, it, 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 I, I've never, I guess, actually contextualized, and maybe this sounds stupid, my coming out process in terms of I saw the TV glows. But like, when you grow up, you're not given definitions for feelings, right? So like, I'm always told, obviously, what you feel towards girls is romance and love and attraction. Um, I think puberty helps shake that off, right? Because like, physically, my body is one thing for someone and doesn't for another. But like, um, you just recontextualize your entire like, understanding of your emotions and feelings. And it's not like those emotions and feelings change, but you just put them like in the right area and it really does feel in some ways like you're looking back at like this wild like random tv show that feels so separated from life because like of course you felt this way obviously this entire time and you just like didn't know because you're not taught that way and especially if you grow up like i did in an environment that doesn't support that like it is so wild to actually consider like your identity being something that is undeniably there because you're always you but not being able to come to terms with that but like i just think kind of rambling here like um how Owen is portrayed in this film. I think this film does a wonderful job giving respect and space to that conversation. Mm -hmm. And I just hope that people understand like this weight of that continually every single day as a queer educator, I have to face that because I'm talking to 30 random people every single year with 30 random families. And some undoubtedly are not (laughs) overly thrilled um, that their child has a gay teacher. Undoubtedly, Mm -hmm. I've got emails about it. Um, Undoubtedly, as I teach US history, and I teach things from a queer lens, and I see the conversations um, surrounding education and sexuality, there are places where I could show a Disney movie, and not to get overly political, but like I can show a Disney movie that has two gay characters in the background, and that will get me fired from my job. Thank God I don't live in a space like that, and I'm able to teach like queer history. But I am consistently made aware of that identity and every single day just existing and being open about who I am as just a gay person is this leap of faith like in Spider-Verse. And again, as a trans individual, I cannot imagine that it just gets bigger and bigger. I don't know. I'm definitely rambling here, but like, um, I think it's really quite effortlessly done in this film. And I love that it gives a voice to that. I, the one thing, the one thing I'll add, it's just like a sentence, and is that uh, about Owen in particular? Is that his story isn't over? I wanted to point that out before we move on, and I think that for me it was it was easy to think that way because I know of so many. I've watched so many documentaries about the trans experience, and there's a certain subset that's about people who transition later in life, like the upcoming uh, documentary that Jack mentioned. I think it's called Will and Harper. Um, yes. so he, he still can, he still can. And I don't know if that was the, just the conversation Niccolo had with Jane about the fact that it's just the realization he had of what's inside of him. He actually had to cut himself open to see what's inside of him. And there actually is hope, but it depends on how you see things. And maybe I feel that way more because I was more prepared for the ending this time, but it's, it very much goes back to the, 
one of the most striking visuals in the movie. There is still time. You can mm -hmm. transition at 70. It's okay. Yeah. As long as you feel safe and you're ready to do it, you can do it. Well, and can I have one what Catherine said about, thing... about... Go on, sorry. Sorry, no. go on, Jacob. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll probably be quite long-winded, but... I okay, I'll be quick then. Sorry, because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just because before I forget, it connects directly to what Hillary said. Um, one thing that I also really loved, which was incredibly terrifying on the first watch, but just how a potential act of self harm is cinematically recontextualized into a moment mm -hmm. of openness. That was something when I when I think that had to like the panic at the end. It was just like, oh no, oh fuck, he's gonna oh sh oh no, because you see, he's a little cutter in the bathroom. It's like, oh god, what's gonna happen now? Um, and the fact that he opens his own chest, and then yes, you see like the TV glowing inside, and the you know the realization of his own life, what it can be, what it could have been, and what it will hopefully be. Um, I found it so powerful. That's something I'd love to. That's something I strive to make with films going forward. Is just finding ways of subverting potentially disturbing imagery into something beautiful, um, and just that moment was so just touching. Um, sorry, <laughs> no, no, Jack, I, I called I, yours. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I I I also like the subverted ex aspect of that, like uh, taking like the ownership of the audience of expectations, quite quite um, uh, generally sort of like brutalized thing and taking that back yeah um i'm just going to talk about about what carson said about like um there's consciousness as well and, and I, I don't want to sound like a fucking white knight here or anything like i'm fucking in the background like like, like with my with my, with my um <laughs> sis t-shirt on and be like just pumping in the air but i do i do feel it's interesting and, and there's an irony that the, 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 the you could say the two queer people in here have not spoke as much so again i do apologize but I, I just think that one thing I wanted to end, just to probably just what I've, last thing I would say is that you mentioned about that queerness cast about that, that coming out thing. And I, I, we, we talked about, again, with the Wachowski, just want to bring it back slightly to that, not not too much, but especially with the, the context of this story is that I found it really interesting when you said about being like in a taxi cab and like contextualizing that, like you've got to essentially decide on day-to-day -day aspects if you're willing, if you're able again willing but also if you are able to have a discussion with a stranger and feel safe and i think in those small environments there's like a form of escape that although that you can feel trapped at the same time it's a horrifying feeling i do think that then adds, adds to the bravery of making this film as conscious state as it is now for this director who is going to be asked millions of times in the press thousands of times about about their trans story, about the trans story here. And granted, that comes with a really great idea of educational tool. There's a platform now being created. They can tell their story. They can tell the allegorical story. They can tell the story of, of acceptance. But I also think that that comes at like uh, an interesting one where that must be a really difficult uh, conversation to have. I have to repeat it. Something so, excuse me, something so private and, and bringing that consciously to the public forum and allowed that to be sort of not necessarily debated because that sounds like it, 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 it's trivial but but consciously brought forward for a conversation to be to be discussed at one point like or like like th th this name now that goes out there for a director is like uh it becomes like a cinema for like trans filmmaker them two things now are attached there'll probably never be a time where they're separated now because this, the, the trans uh, uh, depiction is like still very much in its infancy in, in, in film like 10 years ago it's like I think you're 10 years before that there's an evolution that's uh, feels like there's improvements but it's still an interesting one that we've been talking about the form of, of men playing um, women and women playing men on the cinema screen I think it's interesting um, how that then relates to the consciousness I know we spoke very briefly about this maybe on another podcast so I don't want to go too much of it, but there's still that consciousness of watching Tilda Swinton play a man, and then and then and then like the, there's the the press release is like oh this is a real person, and then the, what is that going back into the to the culture? What is that like? There's interesting perceptions of it, like watching um, Cloud Atlas and seeing that like it's an interesting aspect of how we discuss 
the perception of it if we're not told are we we do we accept or if we're trying to be educated on it do we not like that as as audiences and therefore as a populace is an interesting conversation to have but back to the point i do find it really interesting that these two things now of this filmmaker and the trans thing are not going to be separated and i do feel on one slight note i do feel very 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 sad for this person in the sense of um there is not going to be any private life and the, the fact of their sexuality anymore or their gender. And th- that probably might be a, a benefit for them. So I don't want to speak for them, but open, proud, I wear, I wear it like a, a badge of honour. But also for, for what you've spoken about, Carson, and what you've spoken about, Nick, it feels like a very personal thing that um, is difficult, not on a level of being this feels like exploitive, not that, but you, they've given away their comfort or their private life and projected it on on the film and i remember when when the wachowskis when the the matrix sequels came out they didn't do press and even me was like seven or eight years old nine ten years old i was always trying to google why and find stuff and i remember like reading stuff like oh um i don't want to dead name anyone but let's say lana wachowskis i was going through a, a transition i was like oh what's that and you, you you have to like educate yourself at a point in time then and this is what I think is a really grace, a gracious thing now, considering back then, I go back to the 90s, is that the mid-2000s, there just isn't a conversation about it. I cannot, I cannot state this enough. It, it is either a depiction of, of, of Ace Ventura trans, or it's, it's Paris is Burning, which you can't really find accessible, and there's nothing else. That's the time I lived through for these filmmakers who I adored. You can't find anything about them. You couldn't find what transition man. I don't know what that meant. At like fifth thirteen, I remember they didn't make a film back till oh eight, which I would have been thirteen when it came out, which was um, Speed Racer, and they had dabbled in V for Vendetta, but there was never anything about them on set or anything. And I was, I was like a fucking hawk on the internet. I remember uh, the just trying to read about like where are they why where have they gone like why can't you find pictures of them and 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 ultimately by my own sort of ignorance looking back now because i just wanted answers and because i wanted to know what these people are doing like i I felt i feel like i sort of overstepped the boundary essentially of like priding priving into someone's like personal life where it's like now i wouldn't have done that i think i like i just for any filmmaker i think that I, i think it's when you get old i think just being younger you become like really impassioned and want to know more about these filmmakers you love like these these people made this like oh, I need to know who they are. I need to know more about them. I think there's a wonderful aspect of that. That now will be really gracious for this director because the first thing people will read is like this director is trans, and it will be the first thing they read, and it won't be a fucking um, investigation. It won't be privy to sort of like going into finding out through the press because they've sacrificed their private life. It will be beneficial in the long run. Um, and that's I think that's what the crux I'm getting to. I think that's, there's there's a really sort of um, bitter catch twenty two irony there in that in that that story is so so very personal yet it's projected to the public. I think it's a very interesting sacrifice, and I think you, the question will be is does 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 she think it's worth it? And I have to I have to sort of implore like a hand here and say like I think yes. I think it's as difficult this would be to sort of see on screen and and have a vast amount of people reject this as because a trans filmmaker, disgusting, I can't, I, 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 this is sick. I think it's a really interesting one for the next like 10 years that I, it'd be so beneficial. So I, 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 don't, I don't think it's a conversation anyway. I don't think that she's like, oh, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done this. But I just think that from, from seeing two trans filmmakers who I adore didn't really get that wasn't wasn't afforded the aspect of being able to just come out had to like i think cloud atlas when, when lana wachowski came out publicly they all called them mom and dad on, on set which i think is like a really wonderful warm thing but like the first comment at the berlin press uh press conference was like um uh what's what's been happening in the last five or six years and lana wachowski was like just taken aback i think tom hanks was like oh come on now mom like to take the take the heat out of it it's it, it's a different time now and it's more beneficial so i think that's what i'm i know i'm, I'm fucking waffling now Cass. i'll take that off you 
But um, but yeah, I think that's a really beneficial aspect of this filmmaker in this journey is like, whatever this director makes next, yes, the trans thing will be there forever, but there's so much freedom now. Like, yeah, I'm trans. Like, get the fuck over it. I'm going to go make a queer movie. Like, there's something really enriching about that. There's so... I, I, I'll just leave it to this because I, cause I don't want to make it personal. Like but I have to bring it back to you, Nick. After what you've said the last few years, surely making this now, I bet you've never felt as free. I bet you've never felt more artistically free and that you could go on that set and you could be like, I want to do that. I want to do that. I don't give a fuck if anyone questions, like, this is queer. This is queer. Nick, this is queer for you. Like, you, like who, like you, I think it's such more like freedom for you now. Not to speak for you, please go ahead, please. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, that, definitely, definitely. Um, I have to say, just it's definitely changed things because already, like last year, I, I made Phantom Touch, um, which was based on a heterosexual relationship, you could say, uh, but I wanted it to be queer in a way to just normalize it. Um, I think it's time to let because we've had so many like you know like coming out stories and stories about like identity and stuff from a cis perspective, um, and you see something like I see something like I saw the TV glow, and I think it's not my place to tell stories like this. I don't have these types of stories to tell, um, and I know that many people would want to pigeonhole queer filmmakers into that category it's much easier to control and have the label like lgbt movie where it's all about oh my god like you were i think it was you jack like oh the oppression oh my god the poor lesbians in the 18th century couldn't love each other it's like those are important stories to tell i'm glad these stories are being told i really loved like in 2020 um the world to come i think was an excellent movie but i think it's also important to go forward with this um, and I know that I saw the TV Glow, Jane Schoenbrunn talked about it being a movie about transitioning and what they're doing next is a movie about post-transition or just like enjoying and living your life as a trans person uh, and enjoying sex as well, <laughs> which is something they're very... I'm, I'm super excited about that. I, I just devoted like trans, like trans joy, just trans day-to-day -day life. That's what I want to see because I've, I've known trans people for so long. They've come in out, out of my life and this whole controversy about them. I have mm -hmm. such a hard time with it because I'm like, they're just people. They're cooking dinner. They're doing taxes. They have jobs. Mm -hmm. Who gives a shit? It's not about their suffering. That I mean, it needs to be highlighted to some degree. But yeah, if that's what the direction that they're going, I am so excited for whatever the third yeah. feature is going to be. <laughs> and the novel as well. There's like a giant novel that they've already written that's going to be published. Oh my god! They're making a show also. Early next they have a lot. Good. They have a lot coming out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I'm excited I agree about. With you. I really love that you bring that up, Nick, because I think that's such an important thing that like we need. We need these stories that are not just tied to trauma in every mm -hmm. sense, in every respect of identity. Again, this is what pissed me the fuck off with all of us strangers. We don't need to get into it, Nick. I know you have different opinions, but um, I work with trans youth, right? I work with trans youth who are not even out to their parents, and we have to like go through a whole loopholes and process to deal with that and like stuff. But um, it's really hard hearing them talk about like media and about seeing themselves on screen and seeing themselves like outside of their trauma. Cause even with, I saw the TV glows. Yes. This is a film. And like, I think for a lot of them, this is a very interesting experience and can be very worthwhile, but like they have a real lack and we've talked about it openly, you know, like in their led conversations, they bring it up that there's a lack of content out there for them about trans joy. I'm um, specifically trans joy. There's queer joy. There is, um, LGBT in general joy, but trans joy is not something you necessarily see a ton of. Um, and I would love to start seeing, and I can't wait for this director to go on and make something that's just like completely random, like about nothing about tied to trans trauma or queer trauma. I can't wait to see these voices hopefully continue to expand and explore because like, even while, yes, I love that Jane's out there making content specifically about the trans experience. I can't wait to also see that content and that perspective take on just any random genre, any random film, because it's going to shine through with like a certain um, poignance and like um, 
level of like merit that I don't think you necessarily get. Cause like, it's not just the experience of being trans or being gay or being anything with identity, whether you could talk about race, you could talk about class. It's not just tied to like the specific trauma, but like how a gay person, let's say I'll speak from my experience experiences. Any facet of life is very unique and has a certain eye to it. Um, that I love seeing queer directors take on stories that are not necessarily like the point of them is not this is queer or this is queer trauma. Um, so I just can't wait to see like this director as well as just, uh, t- you know, every other queer director out there. Um, and we've had a conversation before this about trans directors, and I hope we get to see more and more on mainstream levels um, because their work is just like incredibly rich. Um, and seeing someone with that perspective, that eye, give story to any life, no matter what the subject's actually about, is incredibly worthwhile and can be empowering and life changing and all everything you want to say there. So I'm really excited to see this person continue. I love that they're just like so focused on making new media. As we mentioned, has a movie coming out, has a show coming out, which the show is completing the trilogy of this and we're all going to the World's Fair, which I'm so excited to see. They have that book, I think it's a book series coming out that's like this deep like lore, like can't so wait. Big. I love that they're just going full blast on this all and so far is just knocking it out of the park. So I'm really thrilled about this. I second that, but I mean, I made myself clear. <laughs> I, that's what, all I want. And I mean, not only just the the trans perspective, but the queer perspective, the black perspective, Asian, Mexican, like anything. Because the way I kind of like the metaphor I always have in my head is that there's an audience and a microphone and it's always like the same five people coming up to the microphone <laughs> and I want to hear other people talk. I want it so bad. And that's what I'm always looking for. So and it's like trans joy. Like I mentioned that Carson mentioned that I want to see that so bad. Because it, it just needs to be out that that there is like an end point or, you know, a place you can get to as a person where it isn't about the pain or the the difficulties of having that identity. So, yeah, I'm excited. Well, maybe he's starting <laughs> to kind of near the wrap up. I can sense I think we had a really deep, like good therapy session almost today. Uh, maybe let's go Arctic. around and get final thoughts on I Saw the TV Glows. Nick, I would love you to start us off. What are your final thoughts, final things you want to say about the film before we put it to bed today? Just amazing all around. Uh, we haven't really mentioned their names, but shout out to the cast, to Justice Smith and Bridget Lundy Payne. Amazing, amazing performances. Shout out to all of the singers in this film, uh, to all the beautiful sequences in here. Shout out to the fact that this is so steeped in American iconography that it feels completely foreign and fake to me, despite being actually very true to life. All of those oh, moments wow. with the posters in the high school, I was watching it. I was like, that's absolutely insane. And then they said on the Q&A. You guys don't do that? No, we don't. <laughs> What's in your walls? Art? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Paintings? Oh, fuck you off. Know? <laughs> Boring things like that. Um, Paintings. Yeah, it was just like, it was so um, unusual and just in, in suburban and all of that. It's just inherently cinematic to me. Like the United States, I've been there to the States, but they still feel fake. They're still just like something that exists in the movies, you know. Um, but no, just a, 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 transcendent, a transcendent piece of cinema for me. Um, I've been living my best pan life since then, <laughs> just fully coming out after watching it. Um, and it has definitely inspired me to be just pursuing um, openness of ideas in cinema. Not so much related to just the queerness of it, but just the purity of your vision. That something so specific and so weird that's so hard to sell can end up working so beautifully and actually connect with so many people. That's that's the, that's when cinema is truly art for me. So yeah, favorite of the year. Love it, Jack. What are your final thoughts? I'm gonna I'm gonna end on like a, a slightly strange note. Um, I found this to be so powerful and to be so potent. I actually don't ever want to watch this again, and I, I don't say that uh, um, a discrepancy of of how um, important this filmmaker is and how important this film is. I just find this one of the very few films that cuts so close to the bone. I actually find it quite unnerving. And for me, it hit every single uh, facet of my being in that I feel like what I needed to be hit, um, maybe in like two, three, four, five years, if, if we if we ever want to revisit this or there's a conversation or reason to it, I think it'd be very interesting to watch this 
having evolved in my life and being like quite conscious of decisions as I am already. It's just a little bit too close to me, and I can only find, I can only imagine it to be spellbinding for others and absolutely horrifying for some in a certain aspect of of, of certain journeys, um, depending on on which avenue uh, people are currently undertaking their lives or yet to, in in case of Owen's character. Um, I, I, I started very weird like Hillary did. I thought it was like very three star, that it was like, oh, this is really good for. And then I've, I've been sort of really, distru- really struggling between like of how a four and a five. Um, for me, I, I, if I come down to it, I'd be slightly more po- I'd be slightly more optimistic than I'd be pessimistic. This sort of achieves everything it needs to in a, in a, an, an array of avenues and an array of um, incredibly detailed, abstract uh, and personalized messages. Consciously or not, it, I can't help but say that this is a, a feature that, um, it, on a magnitude level, achieves its job. So I can't, I can't not give it anything but like a five stars. Even though I find this very difficult to watch, I, I have absolutely no intention of consciously going back to this because um, I think it's going to stay with me for a long, long time. And in in the world of like filmmaking, like Saltburn, where it's like this full um outrage of like mm, let's do something provocative and then at the end of the day you're like so what you're telling me is that middle class people or working class people are liars pieces of shit who want to like literally eat the rich but are obsessed by them and uh, but yet need them to survive or we can have something like like very quite progressive but outlandishly touching like this to me like two things are just so chalk and cheese um, and I find this so endearing. The one thing I did want to mention, and Nick Nick, Nick said it um, about, I think the soundtrack to this is outstanding. And this is going to get fucking crazy here. I do apologize, but it reminded me of New Moon, the Twilight movie, um, which I'm. Ooh, I, I agree. Like, I like the I, I like the first two Twilights. Got a very special place in my heart because of the time I saw them, my relationship I have them with my wife. Um, they're quite endearing to me, but they're also really interesting. The first film is like. Really interesting about identity and, and, and the isolation, especially New Moon, it gets lost in the sequels. But but the New Moon felt like it was a, a soundtrack of at that time. It just felt so like at that time, yet everything was, was so elevated. It felt ahead of it as well. And I think this is eerily similar in the sense of everything feels like it's consciously meant to be played at that time. It all feels contemporary. And yet at the same time feels like it could have been 10 years ago Granted, it starts in the nineties, and it could be played now, where the film is, essentially ends. And there's 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 a a really great um, interview where the director says that, th- that that's all being commissioned as well from bands that they felt, which I think is fucking brilliant how it's personified and it yet still works on a larger level. Ironic, ironically enough, like the film itself, um, I, I I I adored it. I just don't think I could watch this again. I think I'd need and without sounding patronising, I'd actually need to hold someone's hand. And um, I'm just thank you very much for inviting me because obviously it's very uncomfortable to have these discussions. Um, me for me personally, because I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to offend anyone. Or it's very diff- very easy to be held out of context and then speak for other people who have who have gone through a very different uh, educational or um, lifespan than I have. So thank you very much for having patience with me, casting me your program. But uh, yeah, terrific, really, really, really good stuff. Hillary? Yes. Um, I think for my closing thoughts, um, I'm just leaning more toward, uh, um, I think like the theme of time and then of course of media in it has been important to me. Um, and that uh, it almost literally spells at the end that the media we consume never dies inside of us. And uh, what I, I did identify with, I mean, aside from, you know, being um, coming of age during the time that's depicted in the film and being, overly familiar with wood paneled basements or knowing people where there was abuse in the home, things like that. Um, it, it did, um, it came back to me more this time. Like it, things started occurring to me to this, the second time. Like I, I did know somebody who, um, used to, he used to send me tapes and I still have the tapes and, uh, they died when I was 17 and that's all I have of them. And I put a lot of clips from what they gave me 
on the internet a while ago. I'll put a link to that um, in a, on my list recommendations for podcasts. But yeah, it's it was strange. Like, oh, there's a parallel. There's someone who died when I was a teenager, like Owen, and all I have are these tapes, and I watched I watched them all the time, and just shared them online last year um, for totally different reasons. Or that I knew someone who had um, transitioned and chose the name Isabel. I thought, why was I not thinking about these things? That these things actually do have some overlap um, in my life somewhat, um, and. Uh, there was little things in the film I know we didn't mention, but I have to point them out. Like uh, there was things that I thought would be very meaningful to children of the '90s, like the mother that Owen. Um, I guess it's like his stepmother, but yeah, when he knocks on the door, it's Ashley Benson from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, or that Fred Durst is his stepfather, or that they show the two leads from Nickelodeon's Pete and Pete as adults for like one shot in the film. I didn't recognize any of these people because the film was so out there and so strange. It wasn't until later. I think the only person I really did recognize was, was Ashley Benson. Um, so there's things about also getting older in the film. I think it's a film that's going to really um, impact the young, especially Maddie's monologue about like, your life skipping over chapters like on a dvd i that's something i heard people bring up a lot and your life does tend to get faster the older you get and i think that starts in your early 20s or at least that was my experience like suddenly years just started going like bam 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 and you do feel like you're running out of time but the truth is that you're not running out of time and i feel like that's so important to say if anyone is listening to this podcast that is struggling with that is that you do still have time. And even like I said, if you're going to shake up your life when you're past retirement age, it's going to be okay. And um, hopefully like that film has been able to touch those, those people as well. Like I think no matter what age you are, you, I bet you could watch this at 40, 50 and still get something out of it, especially as the media that <laughs> we're obsessed with when we're young doesn't age well or changes in our head and plays with our memories. There's a, a lot of things in there. So uh, it's, once again, it goes back to what everyone else has been saying. A very rich experience. So much more to talk about. This podcast could go on for four hours, probably. Yeah, I mean, I definitely want to echo everything you've said. I mean, I, I don't know what else there's really to add. This is definitely one of the best films of the year. Uh, horrifyingly impactful. Um, I am excited. I don't want to watch this for a, a while. I think this is one of those experiences and one of those films I never want to become casual to me. I think there's a lot of weight here, a lot of power here. Um, I would love to revisit this. I don't know what love. I think it would actually be like um, quite terrifying, but to revisit this like every five years, um, just as like a check-in, just like see how my relationship to it and my relationship with my own life evolves. Um, definitely like even talking about it, a lot of anxiety, a lot of just like big emotions. Um, but I think that echoes a really beautiful, meaningful cinematic experience. Um, and I wish more films would take the risks and take the boldness um, and take the ambition of this film in every way. I mean that emotionally as an actual film with filmmaking, um, because the results, as I think echoed by this podcast, which I think is very unique for the Clappercast podcast we have done, I mean that in a really beautiful way, um, reflects something that is quite unique and quite brilliant um, and quite needed and quite important. Um, so I would definitely recommend this film to everyone out there. Um, definitely, I would say make sure you're in a decent mental health spot, as Hillary mentioned. This film can be very, I imagine, triggering and upsetting. Um, and I would highly recommend you're in a decent emotional spot to kind of deal with that and digest that. Um, but if you are, I think this is a really, like, again, potential to save lives um, and change lives, if nothing else. So I really recommend it, as I think we all do. Um, so moving on from that, let's get to our question of the week, because both dealing with the film kind of as a meta of what the film is and the actual narrative of the feature, um, I want to ask, what is a piece of media that changed your life? What is a piece of media that impacted you um, that you really love that holds a special weight for you? Hillary, I'm going to turn it over to you first. What is a piece of media that you really were touched by? I have to admit, I struggled with this question so, so much. Um, and I did like write down several answers. 
but they weren't satisfying enough for me to put that forward. But I just wanted to talk about as far as like media changing and evolving, I think that I haven't had that experience yet. I mean, obviously, I think people can read from my voice that, you know, I'm a cis woman, I'm also white. I've been overly represented in a ton of things. But when I've had heart to heart conversations with people, I have a really hard time seeing how my inner life is represented. I don't think I've encountered any character or anything that's had a life like mine or thinks like me or behaves like me or um, has had experiences close to what I've been through. And I think in, I saw the TV glow as this very interesting tipping point. In a way, it is pointing in a direction that I appreciate very much where representation is very much about identity or um, ethnicity, orientation, all these things that are very important. But sometimes I've felt very protective toward those people who are looking for that representation because sometimes uh, the powers that be, I feel like they're pandering to them or just trying to make them cry or like, look, we like this show is nothing but diversity, but it actually sucks. Like it's not very good quality or doesn't actually say anything. Or I've heard of accounts of people saying like, I'm just so glad that there is like, uh, for example, like there's a Filipino actor on this, um, this film that I like, but the film is horrible that it is that representation just keeps getting better and better. But um, as far as something that's in the context of this film, like I, I didn't see myself in it in a life changing way and I'm still looking. And if I'm still looking, I bet a lot of people are looking. So I don't have an answer, but I have a lot of hopes and, and dreams. I think that was a beautiful answer. You definitely have an answer. And I thought it was an excellent one. Um, Nick, what is your pick? Um, my pick is a twofold um, because when I was growing up, I had ideas for movies and ideas for stories, and I never had anyone actually uh, support them. Everyone that I told my stories to always said they were incredibly weird and messed up. Um, so I never really pursued the idea of actually becoming a filmmaker um, until I watched one little film called Blue Velvet in 2017, which just... I felt seen. I was like, <laughs> you can you can do these things. And then I read online, I was like, oh, people and people like it. <laughs> it's allowed. We can tell stories like this. Um, and then there was a video art competition in my university uh, early 2018. And I am positive that if it weren't for Twin Peaks The Return, which I was watching at that moment, if it weren't for that, I would not have been like, you know what? Even with my limited means, with a shitty Sony Handycam that costs 20 euros, <laughs> I can make a short film here. Um, without Blue Velvet and then watching The Return at just the right time, I probably would never have tried to pick up a camera and start making movies and then, you know, meet all of you in some ways and be here. And, and yeah, choices in life. So yeah, that that was definitely a lot of movies have like influenced me and impacted me in personal ways. But I think genuinely, without Lynch and these films, I would not like life would be different. <laughs> Absolutely, Jack. What is your answer for this week? I have a few for different personal reasons. A bit like Nick, a bit like Hillary's, but I've been quite well represented as a white male throughout the uh, from my lifespan on, on representation of seeing the mirror on screen. So I've never felt like oh like oh that's me on screen. Uh, there's a there's a lot of personal things like watching obviously the Matrix the first time like oh my god they they can do this. Watching it very young that, that's like an abstract where I'm like oh my god and that the the the, 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 the how that's grown in the thesis I'm like I, I find that so incredible how it's still got legs it's still growing the culture and society um, everything there just giving it more and more lifespan which is like so endearing for me. There are other things though. Again, being being from the north of England, I speak in a very different dialect to how people would do down south, and the entertainment industry is all down south. And people, when you when you see go to Eton, who are now like Tom Hiddleston and all that sort of shit, they're 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 um they're represented now. It used to be rad. It used to be like your Gary Oldman's and your Tim Ross, who, who granted they didn't have the same accent as, but they were working class people who who were given who, who because of their talent. Were, were um were, were propelled to stardom. It doesn't feel like the same anymore. But representation for me more more comes down to my accent. I'm like watching um 
uh, Ken Loach's Kez, which is like, if you ask any Northern person from a certain age range, like Kez, one of my favorite films, it's my dad's favorite film. And it's that, it's that, it's not just about like a story of a child in Yorkshire. It's also about like, but he talks like I do, like that, that film from thousands of people, millions of people have seen, you know, I think you I think it went to Cannes, like Ken Loach is like predominantly from, uh, gets his work at Cannes anyway, like, you know, that. Shit, the, the wind that shakes the leaves of barley and stuff like that. And obviously, um, the film that we went to go see Nick a few years ago, then his latest one, like Daniel Daniel Loach, was, uh, was there. But but to see that and be like, oh my god, like someone on screen like sounds like me, that's weird. And another one is like Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones, like such a massive thing. They all talk like they're from like Barnsley and, and Sheffield and, and stuff like that. I remember like going to like fucking um, Arkansas and someone's like, oh, you sound like Game of Thrones. Like, oh, yeah, it's. Based on the doubt where I'm from, and there's like a conversation there. I know it's silly, but and then, uh, this is gonna sound fucking stupid, but the other one would be Twilight. I generally think that that's like a really big thing for me in my life. It's like this is just dumb, sh- stupid stuff, and then listening to someone else talk about it and be like, oh, "Well, I actually I find this endearing," which happened to my wife. I was like, "Oh, I get this. I get it from a female perspective of why she finds this so endearing." I, I, that we can watch the films and make fun of it, but there's something about the first Catherine Hardwick about finding a, a, just a kid, regardless of gender, and like put in a place where you feel uncomfortable. You have to find a few things, heartbreak, um, that weird angst between living in the moment but not living in the moment. I think it perfectly encapsulates. So there'll be my three random ones. <laughs> I, I find it really difficult to do as well because of the of the the nature of the beast, but. I hope that uh, comes to certain. I hope that beca- makes sense to certain people. I love it. Those are all great choices. Um, I kind of struggled with this one also because I didn't want to be too basic. I didn't want to say like an obvious one for me. And if anyone wants like my full list of at least films on my letterbox, I have tagged a list called like Carson's personal canon or something. That's like a lot, every film on that is very impactful and meaningful to me in some way, one or another. Um, I thought about books like Steinbeck has been incredibly impactful for me. Um, but I landed on a film we actually talked about on Clappercast. Jack, I think you were there for this. Um, October 2020, I want to say, we watched Miranda July's Kajillionaire. And wow, growing good. with this film is very interesting because, like, um, as I kind of hinted at here, and for a lot of reasons, not just sexuality, like, I have a lot of, like, childhood family trauma, which is, like, a, one hell of a beast. Uh, July, or no, actually it was August 2020 was the first time I ever moved out completely alone. So not when I moved out from family, I moved out from my family like a year and a half before that. But this was my first time doing it completely alone. Also in the middle of a global pandemic. So like the eight to 10 months there was like one of the worst periods of my life. And I remember watching Kajillionaire, like again, that October, I've not revisited it since. But how that film talked about like struggling with trauma and when you have space from trauma, especially is when you start to recognize it and really deal with that beast. I found that to be a very, very brilliant and impactful film that I just really resonated with me. Um, and to this day, I continually think about the film and I continually think about that. I just got Miranda July's book, or book which I cannot wait to read. Um, but that was a film that just really stuck out to me. And it's one of the reasons like I love that Clabbercast gives me a platform to watch like films like that where it's like I probably wouldn't have watched Kajillionaire randomly it got mid reviews it wasn't really that impactful on like a conversation but it's like one of my favorite films of all time so I'll throw that one out there for me uh now let's very quickly just get through rapid reviews let's try to keep this short everyone just anything we've seen recently that we can talk about that we've not mentioned on the podcast Nick I know you've been busy, so I don't know how much you've been able to see, but take it away. What are your rapid reviews? I've seen the entirety of the making of my new short film, <laughs> Never My <Mind> Love, <laughs> which wrapped principal photography last week in Berlin. Um, I had no time to watch any movies, honestly, except for like a couple. I did watch Abigail as the last movie before going into the shoot, simply because I was with a good friend of mine. It was late, but we couldn't fall asleep, and he just went like, hey just watch Abigail. I was like, okay, sure. And it was incredibly mediocre. Um, I was very disappointed by Abigail. I thought it could have been way more fun, way more stylish, way more engaging. Uh, But thankfully, before that, it was my birthday. And I had so many movies that I could choose from in Berlin to go watch in the cinema. And I chose Paris, Texas. First time on the big screen. First rewatch in seven years. Wasn't really a fan the first time around. On this rewatched, I cried my eyes out. It was absolutely incredible. 
Um, just a beautiful, beautiful movie. And I think a tremendous cinematic experience as well, just like sharing it with a crowd. Um, one lady next to me broke down during the end and someone just like stayed there comforting her. It was very um, emotional. And yeah, that's honestly pretty much all I've seen <laughs> over the past two and a half weeks, which is good. It's super rapid, actually rapid fire reviews. <laughs> Love it. Jack, what have you seen recently? So I'll be very, I'll be very short here. Um, I've seen two films. I've seen one twice. I know the one was a palate cleanser. Um, I watched in preparation for Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. I watched the first film. Um, I, partly because I, 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 well, the version I watched, I have an, I have an open map cut of it, um, which uh, is full screen. So it's got big black bars on the side, huge image. I hadn't seen the film in a long, long time. And I, ha I had it on, on, on hand. And uh, I thought, because I've been really busy this week. I, I also, Avatar, 12 hours. I don't know how many hours we put into the MCU. But I just need a slight palate cleanser. So for the week, I hadn't watched anything, really. It's been quite sad. Um, but I watched the open map cut of it, really enjoyed it. Um, probably one of Tim's Burton, Tim Burton's best. Um, just like loads of character. One on a rider in that film. Terrific. Michael Keaton. Uh, Catherine O'Hara. Uh, which I, I adore. Um, it's interesting, we'll be, be able to just because for an hour and like 28 minutes, it's very quick, but there feels like, like 15 minutes of like footage missing from that film in a sense of like building gaps. There's like, you just, you, you have to sort of accept narrative positions and because it's a quirky film, it sort of gets away with that. Um, but it did come into uh, the hands I have a work print cut of Beetlejuice as well, which I watched straight after, uh, which is monochrome black and white to go with the aesthetic of black and white clothes throughout. So no colour whatsoever. Additional sequences, um, which, which like when everyone goes up to the attic, the ghosts are not there and there's like a bit of a, like a, um, a, a goof, but they're actually hanging out of the window. When Adam, uh, Adam Baldwin, Alec Baldwin, which going up, we can't bleeping that name now, but when Alec Baldwin first drops into the uh, to like the purgatory, it's a totally different sequence. The sandworm isn't there. It's a dark room where um, uh, things like uh, I can't remember what it's called when you've got like a like, mechanism in a clock that like you uh, I can't think of it. Um, it's, it's it yeah like yeah that those are like just like. Um, rolling around like it's just it's a very much very different there's additional sequences of like all the family and there's a different alternate ending where she's living with um uh in in connecticut with the ghosts where the other two are in new york which i thought was very strange and there's sort of this idea that she's actually could be actually dead which i thought was even more interesting as all well, but um i i don't know about that but that was that was kind of cool to watch the work print of that and then for the palette cleanser i watched an open map cut Shaun of the dead i just wanted something like i could watch where it was so easy that film to me is outstanding like the, the whole the whole thesis of, of Shaun of the dead is perfect everything in that film works and 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 not i was going to wait till next week but i might as well say this now i must admit i finished this i saw the tv go about two hours ago I had to put something else on because I didn't want to sit with it because I thought it could have killed me this. And I, I I watched about the first half an hour of Hot Fuzz. I just needed something else. So I'll put that in for another thing. But I haven't seen a lot. Um, probably like one of the weakest weeks I've had. But, you know, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice next week. Can't work. I'm happy you are watching it because I certainly will not be. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It's been ungodly hot here to the point where, like, right now, I'll say physically, and this has nothing to do with this call, I feel like I'm just sitting in, like, the pits of hell right now. Um, so, uh, luckily, I have been... So I've just had a lot of time to sit inside in the uh, air conditioning and watch movies. And if you remember from last week, this month I'm watching everything Schrader has ever wrote or direct. Sorry, Nick, I know you hate him, but I quite enjoy him as a director. Um, so just going very quickly, I really enjoyed A Dog Eat Dog. That has easily my favorite Nicolas Cage performance of the last, like, 20 years. In a time where, like, nobody at all understands how to like um, cast Nicolas Cage, write Nicolas Cage. They just make him like this unfunny meme that gives me a headache in the theater. I think Schrader does such a great job at like 
crafting his performance and crafting his personality, let's say, into something quite meaningful. I think he's a really great direct or um, great actor, and it's sad to see him like consistently cast in the roles he's cast in now. Um, I think this is like a way better example of what he can do. Um, I watched Blue Collar, which was obviously excellent. I watched Witch Hunt, which was super fun. Um, not what you would expect from Schrader. Definitely a uh, like more comedic, more campy than one would expect from him. Um, but super fun version of Los Angeles where magic exists. Very predictable. It was like an HBO television film um, about a murder and then they figure out who did it. Super predictable. But overall, I found the especially the world building here to be quite fun. Um, Adam Resurrected, I hate. Did not like that. Jeff Goldblum gives a very strange performance here. Um, I watched The Canyons. Okay, y'all. So I was, <laughs> <laughs> right. I like Schrader, but I, I am open to the idea that directors I like make bad films. And I looked on Letterboxd. Okay, Nick hated this. Jack gave this one star. Jack on in his review is like in the comments being like telling people to stay away from it. It's complete dog shit. So I was like, okay, I believe <laughs> this is going to be a bad film. Um, it stars Lindsay Lohan. Like I fully accept, am accepting this is going to be Schrader's like piece of shit work. And I like love this film. <laughs> I'll be really honest. What a fun, juicy LA erotic thriller. But especially what blew me away is like Lindsay Lohan, call me crazy, is like incredible in this film. Like she might like probably would have been in my personal awards conversation. That like she oh, plays into a lot of like personal depths and trauma and where she was in her life at this time. Very interesting also reading her relationship with this film fascinating production stuff um but i think she's like stunning here not like an amazing film this is not like first reformed but i had a lot a lot of fun with this um so sad that everyone else hated it including the people on this call but that's okay um and then also just randomly i watched midnight cowboy um which was really great um very interesting not from trader to be clear <laughs> another film uh picture winner um undeniably fascinating and bold as the best picture choice i love that this um, look at queerness and the trauma queerness um, and abuse and trauma. It's all there. I, I, the reception this guy is like, oh, wait, that's quite brilliant. I think now from a current context, you can look at what this film is doing and it doesn't quite seem that, you know, um, revolutionary. The impact is not quite there, but still I thought this was a really well put together feature and one I greatly enjoyed. Um, but yeah, I've just been watching a lot of Schrader and having a great time doing it. Hillary, what have you seen recently? Okay, so I did write down some movies that I'd seen recently that I thought were interesting. And then I thought, hey, wait a minute. There's all these amazing movies that are related to I Saw the TV Glow that, um, you know, just rewatching it, they're directly relate to it for me. So I have five. The first one is pretty obvious, but like it references A Trip to the Moon, the Melies film. So if you're able to watch that, I think you can pretty much watch that on YouTube. But if you want to know where Mr. Melancholy's face came from, it's from A Trip to the Moon. Um, after that, I would go check out the video for Smashing Pumpkins Tonight Tonight, which is based on that film. And if you want to see nostalgia, just look at the comment section for that music video. A lot of music videos from the 90s, you'll just hear people waxing poetic about how the golden age of MTV or grunge and all of that stuff, how um, meaningful it is to Gen Xers, etc. cetera. Um, the other thing that I see, saw the TV Glow reminded me of that I would recommend is checking out Local 58, which is a channel on YouTube that has a bunch of short horror films that revolve around um, some lore about the moon. Terrifying stuff, pretty short to watch and um, kind of a rabbit hole you can disappear down. And then, of course, this was mentioned before, but Twin Peaks, The Return, I'd, I'd been tempted to tell people this, like, you don't have to watch the whole series, but what I keep telling people is watch part eight. That's one of the most surreal things I've ever seen that aired on television, and it's very much kind of in the same vein as I saw the, the TV glow, especially the whole last episode breakdown sequence with Mr. Melancholy and the moon and, and everything. Um, a pretty good companion piece. And then the last one, maybe what I'd recommend is if you see I Saw the TV Glow and you think, oh, this was really kind of a lot and it was too much, there's actually this really interesting film that's directly related to the film that has some similarities to it. Um, the producer, or one of the producers for I Saw the TV Glow, directed a movie called Brigsby Bear. It stars uh, Kyle Mooney and it also has a villain that ha is a, a big moon face or uh, a moon-shaped villain. 
And it is one of the most endearing, uplifting, sweet films about someone who has a really strong relationship with um, media, a television show. Um, so it's in a weird way. I mean, if I ran a movie theater and, you know, people wanted to see, I would be interested in showing I saw the TV glow and then Brigsby Bear right after. So people go home feeling good because they are very similar movies as far as like the subject matter, but the way they handle it is different. So overall, those are my five. And uh, I definitely recommend checking those out. Um, they will be on my recommendations for podcast list if anyone needs to double check those. Briggs Bear is so good. What a great pick, Hillary. Um, with that, that's going to do it for our episode today. Thank you all for joining us on this very fun episode. I really enjoyed this. A um, lot of deep conversation, but I think that's always good for an episode. Where can we find everyone on social media? Jack? Well, you can find me on uh, Clapper, Letterbox, and uh, X or Twitter. The username, uh, Jack, Jack, excuse me. You can find me on Clapper, Letterbox, and X or Twitter. The username at Jack Luke Shap. I just wanted to mention. Thank you very much for having me on because I know that this is a pretty much a gargantuan type of episode. But uh, thanks very much for sharing your uh, both your queer journeys as well. I think it's very important to acknowledge that it's easy for me to come on and just talk smack about films and talk talk silly stuff about films and, and articulate myself but um but thank you very much for, for bringing yourself forward a little bit because i know that's not the most easier things to do so thank you very much thank you very much for having me as well my pleasure hillary where can we find you the easiest way to find me would be on letterbox you can find me under the name degel spelled d-e-g-e-l-l-e um, if you go there, I think my, the lists will, um, they are, are um, ordered by when they're updated. So you can find the list I mentioned earlier. Um, there's also um, a little link tree link. I know it sounds kind of like repeaty, but um, it's campsite.bio. If you go there, you can pull up pretty much everything I'm doing on the internet. And if you do scroll down, there's the project VHS Detritus. And if you click on that, it will bring up all the clips from VHS tapes from the 90s or the early 2000s that um, I digitized and put online last year, um, just to give you a taste of what I do in my spare time. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at BP underscore movie reviews, Letterbox just Carson Tamar. Thank you so much for joining us for today's episode. Next week, we'll be back on the Patreon to start our Road to Halloween journey through modern Universal Monster adaptations with our review for The Shape of Water. Um, and then in two weeks, we'll be back on the main podcast here for Bram Stoker's Dracula. We're getting into Coppola. Should be very fun. Should be an interesting conversation. I think all four of us will be back for that episode. So I yes. hope you enjoyed today's conversation because uh, you can experience that again in two weeks. So with that, thank you so much for listening. Goodbye.